of existence, to use that language. So there has to be non-class processes present, which enable this communist class process to exist and be reproduced. And the first one I presented to you last time was culture. And I'm going to do politics and I'm going to do economics. So I'm going to begin with a specific kind of culture, which I started last time. And the idea here is if people, what I mean by culture again, to remind you that the production and dissemination of meanings, plural. So there have to be a variety of different meanings, theorizations present in society in a variety of different forms in order to persuade individuals to participate in the communist and middle class process. That's the argument. So let me start. There has to be a kind of thinking present in society, that's what I mean by culture, a kind of thinking which motivates individuals to participate in the communist class process, motivates them to, to receive the profits that they produce and hence to distribute the profits that they have appropriate. So saying that, let me begin with a question. Okay? How come people do not desire States to participate in the communist fundamental class process, since the way I posed it, it seems to be reasonable that people would want to do that. I mean, what? Yes? Is football's more interesting? I'm sorry? Is football's more interesting to them? You asked the question, what's interesting? Because football is more interesting than paying attention to where oh. money comes. Okay, all right. We can agree with you. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, let me come back to that. Let me. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> can I just set it up again, though, before I. Because the football kind of really threw me. I would have thought of something different. Football. I would have thought of sex. It's just our minds. <laughs> if you, after class, if you went back to your respective uh, dorm rooms, and if you went back uh, to your apartments, depending where you live or your, uh, your homes, okay, and you discovered that all your possessions had been ripped off. You went home to an empty dorm room, an empty apartment, an empty house, whatever. Everything had been taken away from you. I think, irrespective of football, but you may be right, you may be upset. It would upset you that you started out with a TV set, a radio, or whatever, and you ended up with nothing. That would be upsetting, okay? Having been once had my wallet lifted from me, region of Subway. I was very upset. It's upsetting to be ripped off. It's upsetting enough in Boston to have somebody cut you off and take your parking space. 
이게 튀어버린 거야. 그래서 so, let me go back to my question. How come people are not upset over unpaid land? Now you're right. I mean, football may dissuade them. It's possible. So what Marx is the claim here is that in communism, where it is appropriate, they receive. They don't know it's. There's no theft. There's no social theft. It's gone because workers get all the wealth that they have produced. It's theirs. So in much of life, people get upset over having wealth stolen from them. But in this particular case, when it comes to the economy, no one is upset. So the question is then, okay, why do people prefer communism since there's no social theft? That's the question. That's it. It's a rhetorical question. Not the answer. I understand you're anxious, but there's one after. That's but that's the question. So I'm gonna. Why I'm not gonna take your answers? I'm gonna provide the answers. I wanna listen to myself. Ready? People aren't aware. They're not conscious of this kind of thing. They're just not aware. Of it. That's what we started last time. Perhaps if they were aware of it, then perhaps they may really be upset and angry, but they're not aware. And I'm going to get close to your answer. Of the world. They're not aware. They're just not aware. That they're like, you know, look, I've been working overtime from the first day of class to make you aware of it. I got around 47% of you. I don't have the rest. I can tell by your eyes that I've been doing this long enough. You've been exposed to it again and again and again. So it's not terribly surprising that people in the States, or England, or France, Germany, whatever the case may be, are not aware of it. It's not. It's new. It's never been taught before. They haven't been taught. So part of the answer is that they lack class consciousness. They're not aware of unpaid labor. That's what theory does. Theory tries to make people aware of something they're not aware of. You know, this little lecture is made up of particles. You don't see them, you don't think them. And if you take a course in modern physics, they teach you what this thing is made up of. <coughs> Markets determine prices. That's another theory. If you go to credit, if you go to Whole Foods, you don't see the market operating. So economics teaches you, yeah, there's a market operating there, despite the fact you don't see it, you can't see them. So theory, Marxian theory, makes people aware of something which they're not aware of. But it's not only that. There are other theories around that even if they were aware of class exploitation, there are other theories around that says, don't pay any attention to it because it's not important or it doesn't exist. That's your football. And the other theories which exist and which are hegemonic would be non-Marxian economic theory. They say, don't worry about surplus because it says, as I said last time, it's a purple elephant. It doesn't exist. Hence, why worry about something that doesn't exist? So one of partly the power of non-Marxian theory, neoclassical theories, the theory after Adam Smith and Keynesian theory, is to deny the existence of class exploitation. You will never learn about class exploitation in those courses. Why? Because they're not going to teach you something which they claim doesn't exist. That's how Marxian theory contends with these other economic theories, and has been doing that ever since the 1870s. Finally, there are also theories around that say the following. They associate communism, whatever it is, with something that's bad, something that's evil. In other words, the argument, there are a variety of different arguments here, most of which I think you've probably heard. Communism places individuals on the road to serfdom or despotism. USSR, for example. Stalinism, you must have heard of this. Communism is inefficiency. 
That's your reading. But I assigned you know it. It's partly what I assigned it to you. Communism is for dreamers. That's the attack on the utopians. It's probably why it's on the readers. Communism is impossible because there's no incentives. That's Novik. He's very famous for that. Communism is a dreary sameness of dress and spirit. 1984. So you've all confronted discourses, that is, other kinds of meanings, which either deny its existence, classical economic theory, or if they say it's there, it'll put us on a road to despotism, or dreariness, or inefficiency, or whatever. Hence, for the communist fundamental class process to exist, it needs a culture, a set of discourses, that persuade individuals that A, class exploitation is part of their life, and B, they should eliminate it because it's bad news for them. It's unjust to produce a surplus for somebody other than yourself. It's unfair, unjust. It's social theft. Not only that, the surplus is connected to other kinds of problems, the business cycle. That's the lecture I gave you. That's that tableau that's in, that I put on in your, uh, on the website. That's the, you know, the three automobile companies. That's the connection between surplus and the ups and downs of the economy. It's not just a surplus per se, it's class exploitation, but it also connects to this problem of the incessant ups, ups and downs of capitalism. So you need discourses which persuade individuals that A, it exists, that purple elephant or that hostile life. That's not an elephant, that's the, no different than, than laboring and eating and sleeping and so forth, etc. It's just another part of their life. And B, it's a cancer that should be eliminated. Because not only does it kill the individual, but it causes all kinds of other social ills. It's an external diseconomy in nobody's language. And so, to sum it up, these discourses give people a, a, a uh, a class consciousness, and a moral outrage. Just like all the other discourses. I would do the same thing, and I do actually when I teach it. Capital, the cap, capitalism can't exist without its associated culture that, that teach people that they should love capitalism. And it's the best of all possible worlds. <coughs> That's the link between culture in the economic structure, in this case capitalism. So, this new culture, it's a new culture, would have to celebrate the communist fundamental class process. Why? Because it eliminates the social crime of exploitation. It eliminates the connection of that exploitation to other social ills in society. That requires a culture revolution. So, because you get a guy that comes along after World War II, very famous Chinese leader in the Mao's revolution in Mao. And one of the first things he focuses on is a cultural revolution. In order to have communism, you have to have, you have to change the way people think. Is that sufficient? Of course not. It's not nothing like the sufficient. That is part of what has to be in place for people to be in the position to want to appropriate the surplus that they produce. So you have now, if that occurred, you would have now a new kind of democracy, which is that the people would have a freedom from class exploitation. The communist fundamental class process produces a new kind of economic freedom. I mean, we do have the freedoms of voting and so forth. Those have not disappeared. But now you add to them a new kind of freedom, which is the lack, the freedom from class exploitation in society, in part as a result of this culture. So you eliminate the tyranny of class exploitation. So, the, fund, the communist fundamental class process requires this kind of culture in order to motivate its workers to participate in this class process. Because it's not obvious that they might do that without that kind of culture. Then the question becomes, following the logic which we've developed, okay, fine, so you buy that. Who provides the culture? 
is not manna from heaven. That's not the way we operate. We're no longer in the Garden of Eden. So who in your society provides the culture which would enable the communist fundamental class process to exist? And the answer here is there have to be physicians who are producers and disseminators of this culture, of these kinds of culture, which propel the workers to appropriate the surpluses that they produce. If that's the case, then a portion of the surplus produced by those workers has to be distributed to these enablers, these cultural enablers. So right away we have, in communism, the workers are producing and appropriating and distributing, but they have to give a portion of that to these <coughs> cultural providers. So that the people on the right hand side of the equation can be sustained and they can provide a culture that I just went through, enabling the workers to want to participate in this process. So they get a cut of the surplus, they provide a culture which helps to make this thing on the left hand side exist. That's the importance of culture to economics and the importance of economics to culture. There's so much rhetoric in the universities about how these different departments, that is, these different parts of the university should affect one another, so humanities and social science and so forth, etc. I dare say most of the people have no, absolutely no idea what to do other than saying that. Here's an example, here's an analytics of how it might work. This is how the culture, the humanities, the social sciences, and so forth, in this particular context, provide the connection enabling the economy, that is, the Communist Party economy to exist. And then you get a surplus, which will be distributed to these people. So we've done this several times in capitalism, but now we're articulating it for communism as well. Notice something. Yes, sir. Would you say that culture is produced, or there are cultural providers in capitalism right now? Absolutely. That, that, that's what I said. Absolutely. Okay. If you, you, know, you take a course in 103, 203, 104, 204, those are cultural providers. Absolutely. But it's not just air. There are a variety of different. It's the air we breathe, as far as I understand it. Capitalism is good. Those are cultural providers. The people who provide the theory that it's good. Oh, yes. But, but that's true for any society. It's not just for capitalism and communism. That was true in feudalism. It's true in the ancient one that I thought. It's true in slavery. It was I go there. I can see quizzical looks here. There were institutions in the American South that provided a culture in which it was good to have slaves. No. That was called the U.S. Congress. We learned that in high school. That's why we had, in part, the Civil War. Okay, so the answer to your question is an important question is yes, absolutely. Culture is always going to be part as is politics and economics. We have a problem on the black. Okay, so we have a way we've got this. This is in part cemented into society because of this social group. But the moment I say that is the moment that we have a problem, which is these individuals in communism need not be the same. You could have cultural providers, and then it reduces the surplus in the cars and the TV sets and so forth, etc. Yes, I understand the workers who produce the surplus in car production and TV, they appropriate it and they distribute it. But they may be distributing it to different individuals who are cultural providers. And so you have a possible conflict, a tension, and a conflict in society between the producers of the surplus and the cultural providers, the educators, the poets, the writers. For example, if you're standing over here and you're doing theory work, you might say, uh, I look at my hands, I look at the chart, they're clean. 
If you're over here, you got calluses. Because you're working on an assembly line. I brought over here, it may be possible to say, you know, I'm dead. I don't know. My hands, I work with my brain. And my brain is higher up in the body than my hands. Something stupid like that. So you can have then a struggle between these two groups on the different sides of the equation. Could that struggle erode communism? Of course it can. So communism is not nirvana. It's not that kind, it's not utopia in that sense. You still can have contradictions. You can have older people here, younger people here, younger people here, older people, you can have conflict over age. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, Before I go on. If you look just loudly. Um, Wonderful. Okay, so she's going back and reminding us of the following. There's a different discourse than the one I'm presenting to you, which we did earlier part of the course, which comes out of Mr. Engels. It's called Orthodox or Traditional Marxism, in which the mode of production determines the culture. That's called economic determinism, for what you know, in terms of what I presented to you. Now we're presenting something different than that. We're saying that the left and right and the economics and the culture over the term cause each other. You're absolutely correct. We're refuting and arguing against one way causation. That's right. I'm going to go on now to the next one. You understand? So we have, in terms of what you just said, we have culture as one of the, one, just one of the partial causes. I'm going, to, I'm going to do several causes. One of the partial causes, that's this capital. And this is. So culture is both cause and effect. It's not one or the other. For determinism, okay, they refuse to accept culture as a cause. They just add economics determines everything. So a revolution over the relations of forces of production would automatically produce the appropriate culture. We're arguing against that. Yes, my right. Um, so Did you have a good time? Yeah. Um, I was saying that's subsuming class process, I'm a little confused. Uh, okay, the, uh, so this is the subsumed class process in communism. So the workers receive the surplus that they produce, and they must, those workers, distribute a portion of it, I don't know, we're going to come back to how much, they must distribute a portion of it to the cultural, to the cultural providers. So the cultural, I, I thought you were saying the cultural providers. Yeah, the cultural providers then occupy a communist subsumed class position, they provide a uh, non-class process, which is one of the conditions of existence of class. So here's the class, the fundamental class process in communism, and we have just established one thought culture. It's buried in your notes someplace and in your reading. Okay. I give you two lectures on this. So culture is one condition of existence of class. Yes. Sorry, I just missed you. Yes. Is open determinism the same thing as the dialectic, or are they different? Okay. Yes. So open determination is a modern word for the dialectic. That's correct. So the dialectic is very old. It goes back to Greek philosophy. The dialect, the people who work with dialectics, they were called skeptics. They were skeptical of the. Uh, Plato rationalism of the time. They were skeptics, that's what they were called. And they came up with this notion of dialectics. And the next big guy to do this is his name was Hegel. And then it continues, it continues on. The man who comes up with the name over determination, his name was Freud. So he worked in psychology. 
And in psychology, the, the idea there was, you, you know, some of you take the courses, you know this stuff better than me because you're psych majors. The question was, how, do your, how does your conscious language complexly overdetermine your unconscious language, and how does your unconscious language shape your conscious language? The unconscious language is when you dream. So how do your, does the language that you speak to yourself in your dreams affect our behavior when we're awake, and how when we're awake does that affect our dreams? So they overdetermine one another. It's a complex, uh, you know, uh, shaping here, and then, and then you know, before you sit down, you tell somebody what their dreams that you figure out why you act the way you do. Yes. Okay. How do you convince the people who are the cultural providers, who are normally driven by economic incentive, to provide culture to people? <laughs> I understand your question, but we'll, we'll discuss this. Uh, it's not that I disagree with your question, but I can't keep coming back to it. Uh, okay? So, I understand. I appreciate it, honest to God. Uh, or honest to something. I appreciate it. Okay? But I can't keep coming back. I understand that incentives worry you and you're concerned with it. You shoot it. All of that, what I told you before, and other people in class did as well, and I told you in the medium, is that that's a very broad spectrum. We often do things not just for market incentives. I'm teaching you not just because of the market. Okay? I'm teaching you for there's a variety of other kinds of incentives. And they have incentives too. And it's not given in your nature. So you were here last time. So the society itself overdetermines the incentives. You know? So it's up. Incentives are socially contrived. You can't reduce them just the markets of the law. Everything affects them. And any good manager understands that. Any good manager understands that. The people you get people to do what they might not otherwise do, not just in terms of paying them more, but kissing them and loving them and disciplining them. Those are all different kinds of incentives. You ever play sports, you know Don well, your coach gets you to do something you might not otherwise do, not because he she is paying you. So, right, uh, open determination is a notion of causation. And the notion of causation there is every cause is an effect and every effect is a cause. And the young lady behind you, she raised the issue is okay, traditional Marxism, there is an ultimate cause, which is not an effect. That's the more introduction. That's a, a, uh, that's a problem that, that Mr. Engels did. <laughs> of course, I'm going to show you the problem of the 20th century as a result of Engels treating the mode as an ultimate cause and not an effect. Okay, yes, sir. When did people start to think of it in other terms? Um, Freud writes his uh, analysis, I don't remember when he, this was published, uh, so he, he publishes this analysis of dreams, it becomes a you know, famous text. It's the foundation of, of modern psychology and psychiatry. Uh, in, in Marxism, it's picked up by a man by the name of Lukács, uh, who was a Polish Marxist, very famous man. Um, and then it was finally picked up by a French philosopher whose name was Louis Althusser, A L T H U S S E R. And, and Althusser uh, was a, you know, perhaps the most famous philosopher in France or in continental Europe for many years. And he trained a lot of other philosophers, including a guy you may have studied at the university, a guy by the name of Foucault, F O U C A U L T, which I think you're supposed to read. So Foucault was a student of Althusser. And to make a long story short, this is a different course. Uh, but overdetermination, is, overdetermination leads into what's called postmodernism. That's, those would be different courses. So it's a, it has its, I'm doing mostly the political parts of all the determination, but it has a philosophical aspect to it as well. I have actually no idea who we are, but so, it's a question, so I'll just go on, talk about the Red Sox. Yes? Uh, you might have already 
went over it, but with the SSCP, SSCP. will that eventually make um, class exploitation? To do that for me. The, with having will this the, make class exploitation? Do that yes. Um, because the cultural providers are now getting the sur part of the surplus when they're not producing. Right. Okay. Ready? So, I understand exactly your question. Here's the answer. What we're after is the, and it's very important for this, this goes for any theory, by the way. You're, you're after, in this case, the initial production and appropriation of surplus and the initial distribution of the surplus. So class exploitation has got only to do with something very narrow, analytically, that is. It's got to do with the appropriation, I'm sorry, the production and appropriation of surplus. Okay? So, um, this is going to take me, but it's a, your question is so important. Okay. Surplus of profits. Okay, the big profits. So some people get a lot of profits. And so economists come along and they want to explain why that's the case. Right? Um, in a world in a world in which there's equal exchange, how the hell can you have something extra called profits? Um, and so there's a, there are two explanations. There's the non-Marxian and the Marxian. Marx comes along and he provides his answer to that question. And his answer to that question is what we're calling the fundamental class process. And for like him, just to take you back, he says, okay, individuals have a, a great freedom that they struggle for, which is the freedom to sell their labor power their capacity to produce. Other people have the freedom to buy. So what, what do the buyers get when they uh, purchase this commodity labor power? They get the use value of labor power. And so they, they consume the commodity labor power, not by eating it, by putting the labor to work. And then they get the value that the workers have produced over the workday, which is the use value of labor power. If they pay the workers less in value than what they get from the workers in value, there's a surplus value, that's the fundamental class process. That's all it is. So the fundamental class process refers merely to getting more in value than you're paying in value. You got that? Yeah. Okay, now, you ready? Just take this for a minute. Pass in the dollar, goddammit! Okay, so that's an ordering. Okay, so that's all that is is an ordering of now, lots of things are going on. Okay, you know, you're sitting there as a student, this is the professor, I'm holding a terrorized, what is this crazy man doing? And all those things are occurring along with the fundamental class process. But we're referring just to the ordering of behavior. That's it. Okay, and that's what the fundamental class process refers to. But you're quite correct. That means that the people have, he has the dollar. Okay. Then he passes it to me, and I'm a cultural provider. That's important, very important, because this wouldn't exist without that. But that's still distinct from and different from the fundamental class process. Oh. What else? Before I'm going to politics next, with Donald Culture. Okay, sir, you just lie, because there is a hum here. Alright, sorry, you kind of lost me in that last bit. Uh, it's okay. I know that's not but in my mind, and I just, this is what I'm thinking, and I don't want to ignore it. You can just, okay. just raise it. Thinking the wrong thing. So, class exploitation is avoided because the cultural providers are providing a culture that, set, that says that it's okay for them to get a certain part of, of, of the surplus. Okay. Is that? Not quite. See, but I, I'm going to do, it's going to be, Many things here, and I'm just developing one of them. Yeah. Right. Okay, so there's going to be a whole bunch. You can't reduce it to cultural norm. Let me do it again. Then. He's got. He's got. He's got he's that. You can't see that because you're looking at me. You can't reduce it to cultural norm. So this notion of overdetermination says that there are many, many causes, not just one. If it were just one, I would be a cultural determinist. A mistake that Ma made. <clears throat> if you change the way people think, you automatically get this. No. 
I'm just going to show, I'm going to undo that. It's just one condition present. Your behavior as an overdetermined cycle, your behavior depends in part upon culture, but also depends in part upon economics and politics and nature and so forth, etc. And you can't reduce you or me to one of these processes. You got that, man? Yeah. Okay. It's very, very important, this question. So let me do politics now, because we're going to do precisely what you asked me about. There has to be a politics in place in order for the communist fundamental class process to exist. This is necessary, but not sufficient. So we need a political structure. What do I mean? We need rules, laws. We need the ordering of human behavior. Besides that, or in addition to culture, to have this communist class process. Let me give you, and I'm going to give you a whole bunch of examples now, just like I did in culture. There has to be rules and laws whose effects support the fundamental class process that the workers both produce and appropriate and distribute service. For example, there may be a law that states the following. And you could be, I'm going to be very concrete because we're talking about our country. Here is an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. We have, as you know, Bill of Rights, but they're all political rights. So here is a new economic right okay, that, you know, that Congress would have to pass, they would have to you know, discuss it, we would have to be voted on, and then the states would have to vote it on. Suppose we went through all that laborious process, and the Supreme Court adjudicated that it was consistent with the Constitution, so we had a new Bill of Rights which would say the following. Everyone who participates in the production of surplus shall be an appropriator of that surplus. Bang! There's your law. Which we now don't have. Now think about it. We have enormous freedoms in the states. Political freedoms. I can't think of a society that has the freedoms that we do. We're not good enough. But we don't have them. So you would have, besides the culture in place, it may be this need for this new kind of law, this new amendment to the U.S. Constitution, this, which does what? It says that you are a producer of gross profits, of GE and GM and IBM and so forth, you're also an appropriator. You sit on the corporate board of directors across the United States. I'll come down in a moment, I'm going to explain that. But that's a new law. Let me give you other laws and rules. Maybe there should be law, would be laws about who owns what. Okay. So those of you who like collective ownership of the means of production, okay, you could have a law in society, this is in addition to the one I just gave you, you could have a law that says everybody in society, if they're a citizen of a society, there shall be an owner of the means of production. If you like that. Notice that. That's distinct from who produces and appropriates. But if, you know, if ownership of the means of production brings you a bell, okay, then you might want that kind of law. And I think I showed you in class what that would give you. That would give you a social dividend from the service. If you prefer private ownership of the means of production, if you make an argument that, that's fine. You could have a communist level of class process with private ownership or with collective ownership. Because the ownership of the means of production or anything is different from the production and appropriation and distribution of a surplus that's made possible with the means of production. Those are two different things. They're not to be conflated like Engels did. That was his mistake. That's Nove's mistake. That's Kowski's mistake. That's Stalin's mistake. They are distinct entities. Third, if you're worried about what I mentioned to you before, then let's go back to what we talked about in this course. Maybe you want rotation, you want a large rotation. <laughs> Maybe you want, you know, every year or six months or every two, three years, you want the people on the left hand side to be on the right hand side, the people on the right hand side to be on the left hand side. You want a rotation of tasks. But you're worried about this. Then you might say to me, oh my God, Professor Resnick doesn't know how to produce a car. And the guy that's producing the car doesn't know how to provide Marxian theory. And I would say to you in the answer, that's possible, but it's also possible with a different kind of educational and motivation system that they could. And in your age, that should appeal to you. 
That's our practical motion. Everything's up for grabs. Why not? Why not? It's possible. The United Nations has done all kinds of studies of how long it takes to get people to be trained in technicians. They discover that can be done that if the, if the training is appropriate, often it takes six months to train a people, train a person to work a blade in a complicated way. <coughs> the Chinese discovered after the revolution it didn't take very long to train a person to do 80% of the medical tasks that were necessary in the rural areas. They were called barefoot doctors. They couldn't perform eye surgery, but that's only a tiny percentage of the problems that we have. They could dispense medicine, they could read your heart, they could take a temperature, and so forth, etc. So it, it requires a revolutionary different way of looking at education and the product of education. That's consistent with what we talked about utopia. Nature is not given. If nature were given, how could you would not be going to the university? You all understand that education can change it. Laws may be present which Talk about ready now. How is the wealth to be distributed? Is economists have been studying now for hundreds of years two ways that wealth, produced wealth, could be distributed. One way is called markets. Competitive markets is a way to distribute wealth, inputs and outputs. That's not the only way. For much of human history, we didn't have markets. Wealth was distributed, inputs and outputs on the basis of some people in society intervening in the society to set the values of this wealth, whether it be the tribal leaders or we'd be planners, as Mr. Engels and the rest of his characters want. There's two, and there's other ways too. There's combinations, there's gifts, and so forth, etc. So we, we're, the economists talk about these two great ways, and unfortunately they talk about one way being the other. I just gave you a lecture actually two lectures, on problems with both ways. You'd be hard-pressed nowadays to argue that markets are always the best way, given the business cycle, and given what's happened in Japan. Those are two external diseconomies, which are horrible. You'd be hard-pressed to make an argument for planning after reading Nolan. So whatever, just like property, whatever means, you know, fine if you want private markets, no problem. If you want planning, go that direction, whatever. Either one of them can be a condition, either economic structure can be a condition of existence for the communist fundamental class process, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. I will, I will do that in class since I know it's so important. So just get the idea. You can have either kind of market structure or complex combinations and they will be supportive of the communist fundamental class process. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Um, did the business cycle result in communism due to uncontrollable factors like the environment? If like a huge forest fire destroyed an entire forest and like there's an industry that's based on forcing, like then there's going to be a business cycle. Absolutely. I just that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Absolutely. So you can have you can have a communism, whether it be planned or unplanned, doesn't make any difference. But they don't pay attention to the environment. We have a complicated reason. That's not part of their culture. So they forget, remember, they, they forget that uh, the production of goods and services can have an impact on the environment, and then the feedback can be global warming or whatever the case may be, and it can destroy communism. Absolutely. It's not utopia. And the idea that it is utopia, if it were established, that can undermine it itself because, precisely as the gentleman just said, they don't pay attention to those things that could undermine it. Whether it be the different individuals on the left and right hand side of the blackboard are not paying attention to the environment, blah, 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 blah. But that's true of capitalism, too. It's true of every single society that you can possibly think of. That's supposed to be one of the payoffs of education, right? To make you all sensitive to and aware of all the infinity of costs and benefits that go on in society. You, I mean, you're not gods, you can't do it. It's the best you can. So you can get. Oh, yeah, go ahead, man. Go ahead. You want one? 
So let's continue. We might need a rule or a law in terms of, beside the market structure, besides who owns what in society, laws until, in terms of what should be the division between necessary and surplus. That is, what should be the value of labor power in communism? What shall it be? Should it be more or less? How much, the question that arose before, how much surplus should be given to the cultural products? A lot or a little. But notice something. The workers in communism would be in a position, which they're not in capitalism, to contribute to that discussion and to make that decision. Right now, they're not in that position. But in this kind of, because they would receive the surplus they produce, that they would be part of a discussion on how much of that surplus should be given to the cultural providers and the political providers and the economic providers and so forth, etc. That's a new kind of freedom that we have. Now let me be very, very concrete, okay, on this, the next one. Because some of you have asked me after class. We have a communist, let's assume, we have the communist fundamental class process, process existing. We might have the following kind of law. The workers who produce the surplus shall gather together, let's say, four times a year, quarterly, and receive the surplus that they have produced and distribute the surplus. So in other words, there has to be a parallel kind of legal, and of course, cultural structure. They have to understand what they're doing. That's what's cultural. Parallel legal and cultural structure as there is in capitalism. In capitalism, don't forget now, the boards of directors, those are the people who receive the profits, they get together roughly four times a year. That's it. They get together in particular sites, typically the top floor of very tall buildings in the major cities, typically New York City, and they receive the profits in that quarter. Does that mean they receive the profits by dump trucks arriving? Going up the elevator and dumping money on this long oak desk. Of course not, that would be stupid. So what they receive are pieces of paper. And they always have. They receive computer output, which tells them what's the total sales, what were the C, what was the V, and what's the SV, the gross profits that they got in that particular quarter. That's what these communist workers would have to get when they would get together for each of these quarters. And these could be across the entire society. Because if you think about it, any corporation has its factories across the entire world. Multinational corporations. Well, in, in, in a parallel way, the workers would have to receive these accounting sheets which contain this important information so that they can make decisions on what to do with the profits. And you can have a variety of different ways they can make these decisions. If you like democracy, they can vote. Majority vote means that's not the only way it could happen, but if that pleases you, that's fine. And, you know, to make it exciting and interesting, you could designate these new centers in which the workers would sit on a quarterly basis and receive the surplus, materialize the most chiefs, and make decisions about how it shall be distributed. You could call them appropriation centers, build new ones to make it attractive, make it very exciting, teach people that this is an important and key part of their life, like voting or whatever. Right? Because people's minds are now moving we through that, and so this could be an exciting and interesting. It's an enormous power that people would have if they received the profits and distributed them. As a matter of fact, let's go to the next step. And some of you have asked me this. This is impossible. This is not feasible because people are too dumb to do this. So, what's your reaction to that? This is so, this is, puts so much power in the hands of workers across America, probably 100 million people. Hey, what? What's your reaction? Is it too provocative? Yeah, man. 
it, it seems like it takes them so long to become basically experts in what they're, the money they're spending that they wouldn't be able to make a surplus anymore. Good. 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 Any other objections? Yeah. Well, it's sort of like the whole basic reason we have a representative. Like, sorry, yeah. It's sort of like the whole basic reason we have a representative democracy as opposed to a direct one. Like, it got me there. Well, I mean, we don't think that we have the time to. Oh, okay. Okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've said there's plenty of directors from Wall Street that are running their companies into the ground. Um, you know, there are plenty of boards, people on Syrian and boards of directors now in capitalism that, that are running their companies into the ground. So it, it's not, I mean, if we. General Motors? Did you ever get a group of turkeys like that? I mean, my God! <laughs> Gee, whiskers! 20 years ago, U.S. Steel? The American television industry? Which is no longer exists? I think I agree with how about the fall? It's a general kind of argument. What? Since we just did this, let's do it again. That is feasible in socially contrived. It's in the, what is feasible at one time becomes unfeasible at another time, and what is unfeasible at one time becomes feasible at a different time because of a changed social context. Let me give you two examples. This is, so the argument here, it's quite feasible for the workers to produce, appropriate, and distribute the surplus. And they would be every bit as efficient or inefficient as any other group in society, including Iran. Whatever. Here's the argument. If I take you back in time to, I don't know, let's say 1237 in England. Relax. 1237. <coughs> two lords, two lords are discussing whether or not there should be democracy giving the right to vote for serfs with a majority of the population. Lord A says to Lord B, are you nuts? You would give the right to vote to people who are next to cows? They have the IQ of a cow. The only thing that's outstanding about them is they sit in the field. That's true. Outstanding in the field. They stink. They don't bathe. Look at the way they dress. They're really stupid. To give these individuals the right to vote is to destroy civilization. Now, it took several hundred years, but those serves for the right to vote. And civilization did not end. And we take it for granted. Except, you know, when somebody teaches it. What was not feasible, impossible at one point in time, the right to vote to everybody, became perfectly feasible, reasonable, people found the time to do it. Let me take another one to drive this home. At one point in time, let me go back and know to the right to and this right to vote, so that I can get a really hammer this. When did women get the right to vote in the United States? In the 20th century. And think about that. Half the population did not have the right to vote. On what basis? They are weaker, not as smart, didn't have the time to figure it all out. My goodness gracious me. So you had people arguing at the time that American society would fall apart if you gave the right to vote to women, to African Americans. You need like, people who don't have property. That goes back to our revolutionary time. People who vote had property. People who didn't would vote. So what is feasible at one, I'm sorry, what is not feasible at one point in time becomes feasible later on. Society did collapse. Let's take another one. If you go home at some day, I assume you'd be out of the household now. You go home and you go to your mommy and daddy and you say, it's not kissing to me, right? Um, Dad, Mom, I'm going to marry Mary. You know, remember Mary? No, remember I went out with her in high school, love, and I get married. Oh, they'll say, bravo, wonderful 
those are the greatest things that ever happened, and all and so forth, the celebration, and all and so forth, etc. That's it. That. If it were a hundred years ago, and you said that, your mother and father, but more likely your father would say, you married her, you're no longer my son or my daughter. I choose who you marry, not you. I have that power. So that, you know, that's the story of novels and movies. As you all know, it's kind of fun. What was not feasible at one point in time, the power to decide marriage was in the hands of the parents, it becomes perfectly feasible, understandable, and part of our lives. No child, and I hope no parent, would wield, attempt to wield that kind of power. No child would be swayed by this human. Looking at you, there's no way you find it a joke. What was once was a joke today, that was real serious stuff, nothing wrong. I could duplicate this for you again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Hence, it's quite possible to conceive of the situation in which the workers, with the culture, with the laws, would be in the position to receive surpluses aggregated across many, many different enterprises, get together, and make those complex decisions. And that might be a risk that you would be worth taking. Rather than see those workers being unemployed today, see their health benefits and their pensions cut, it might be the case that they were in a position to allocate the surplus, they may not cut their wages, reduce their health benefits, cut their pensions. So that's a different possibility. You might want to take that risk. So, to summarize this, you would need all kinds of laws present in society, not just the culture. These laws, these rules, and so forth, enabling this to exist and to grow. So a cut of the surplus, this is the gentleman's question, has to be given to these political providers who provide everything that is, you know, it's just important in a different way, who provide all the rules and laws that we just went through. And yes, they may be, it would run the same problem. They may be different individuals, and so forth. Let me just repeat what we just did in a different way to make sure I get this point across. These political providers, let me just focus on two of the many laws. One law might say, this is what you like. If you like collective ownership, one law over here might say, okay, there shall be collective ownership of the means of production. That, that's a possibility. Okay? People always ask me, what do I care? I don't care, to tell you the truth. If you like this, that's fine. It's rather than private property. If this, as I said, this is something that makes you happy a little bit. This is different from this law. Law A, law B, uh, produces a surplus labor the same as appropriates. Those are not the same laws. Doing it again and again so we don't, you know, because Engels, mixes, Engels conflicts the two. Or he deduces this one from this one. They're two different laws. Okay. The final step, no stop. We did culture, we did politics, how about economics? Why not? Go back to the first part of the course. Let's see that surplus there. Okay. We've got surplus labor in communism. So we have uh, surplus labor in communism times its productivity, and that's the wealth to distribute it this way. 
So the work is in communism. They do necessary. Times the productivity, and that's the wealth for their consumption. And this is the wealth enabling this communist fundamental class process to occur. And maybe Notice now, suppose A is zero. What's A? That's the productivity of labor. The productivity of communist labor. That's an economic idea. If the productivity of labor in communism is zero, then you learn this in, I don't know, second, third grade. Zero times a positive number is zero. This is zero. This is zero. This society dies. So it's not just politics and culture which are necessary. You need an economy. You need the production and the distribution of wealth. The productivity of labor has to be positive. And by the way, the higher the productivity, the more consumption for the workers and the more consumption for the enablers so the society can grow. So the productivity of labor is not a minor matter. So we need a positive productivity of labor. That's not all <laughs> in terms of economics. I'm dealing now with So I'm not dealing now with culture, I'm not dealing with politics, economics. Suppose we have in this society division of labor. That's another thing in economics. What does that mean? Well, Suppose in this society, like in most, individuals need two different kinds of goods. They need, make life simple, agricultural goods, they need food, and they need non-agricultural goods, they need cloth and shelter and tools and so forth, etc. So they need manufactured goods, all those items which are necessary for their survival, and they also need food goods to survive. They need two different kinds of goods. And we have a division of labor in the society. What does that mean? We have individuals, communist workers, who work in agriculture producing food. And we have a group of individuals working in, in say, the cities producing manufactured goods, including the tools to produce food. Got it? So we have a division of labor, we have specialization of tasks. What is the economic idea? And hopefully that will give us a higher productivity in the agriculture and industry. Question. How do you get the food from agriculture to feed the workers in industry? And how do you get the manufactured goods produced in industry to support the agricultural workers to produce more food and cloth. That's my question to you. I'm assuming here that you cannot uh, wear an apple. Uh, people think you're crazy. Okay? So you need cloth. You need clothing. You can't put an apple on you. And I'm assuming you cannot eat cloth to get a tummy ache. So each producer once you have a division of labor and a specialization of tasks, each of these communist producers requires the other good to survive. How is that to be accomplished? Yeah, man. Economic providers. I can't need. Economic providers. No, I need a better answer than that. I, I like what you did, but I need a better one. Yeah. Well, you would still have free markets and communists. So, no. so one answer is the markets solve that problem. Competitive free markets. You understand? That's what economists have been working on. They set up the problem the way I set it up, and one answer is markets. Those are the enablers. The invisible hand of the market. That solves that problem. So we have a food market, and we have a clothing market, and the prices in those respective markets determines the relationship between food and cloth. Wow, you should be excited. It took, I don't know, a thousand years to come up with that solution. Give me another one. <coughs> yes, good. Precisely. So the, another way 
is to plan the damn thing. Plan it. Everyone recognizes the need for food to flow from agriculture to industry and from uh, uh, crop to flow from industry to agriculture. You know what? After I just said it to you, but you probably figured it out yourself. One solution is competitive markets. The other solution is planning. You all have a family structure. You've all come out of a family structure. You know inside your family structure there's a problem how you allocate resources to produce output, food and clean clothing and cleaning the house and so forth. There is done on the basis of planning. The family intervenes, typically mother, father, or whatever the case may be, they allocate the labor. You are supposed to, you, know, you clean the table, you make the food and so forth. It's not done by the market inside the family structure. Does it work? If it didn't work, we wouldn't be here. So planning is another way to solve this problem. That is, people shall decide how much food and cloth shall be produced and the relationship between the two, how food and cloth will exchange for one another. So these are, the, and, and we have our likes and dislikes of both of these, that's why I assigned you Nova, so you can get both the likes and the dislikes in terms of this, because nobody's complicated, he gives both. I have you know, a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to do, uh, let me do for today the planning, and then I'll do the market one later on. So let me do the planning because that's not often done. So I'm, I'm, I'm examining now, I don't want to lose it, the economic structure which is required to exist to have the left hand side of the equation and to have it grow. Just like I did politics and culture, but now I'm doing economics. So we have two outputs, food and cloth. Suppose it is the case that the, let's say the planners in society, they say, okay, let's figure out how much labor it takes to produce food and cloth, including their inputs. Let's figure it out. For example, suppose it takes, I'll use the example I think I did in class. Suppose it takes uh, eight hours to produce a unit of food. So you do a study, a study. You have to hire economists, engineers, they do a study, and they say, okay, it takes eight hours. It takes four hours of labor and body machines. They do a study, they figure that out. And it takes four hours of living labor to produce the food. And together, the value of the food is eight hours. That's the amount of labor it takes. to produce the food. That's the value of the food. Yeah? What was the first part of the race? So this is the, from before, so this is the quantum of labor it takes to produce tractors, to get tools, machines. Who does this? Well, you need an engineer, you need an economist to do that study. In economics, the guy's name was, who invented this, is long dead. You have a Nobel Prize for this. His name was Leontia. He was a Russian. He migrated to the United States. He taught at Harvard for many years. He's very famous. So you do a study of how much labor it takes to produce the yeah, apple, the food. Not only way you do it, but that's what you want. Now you can also cloth. You do the same study. So you want to know how much labor is embodied in the machines? That's a cost. And you want to know how much living labor requires to produce cloth? I suppose the answer here is four. That is, it takes you know two hours here plus two hours here to make life easy for myself. That's the total labor required. So to produce a unit of cloth, 
takes four hours. To produce a unit of food takes more, it takes eight hours. And let's assume, by some reward, argument is the same kind of play. It's you. Okay? Now, the big question. Think for a minute. You get the answer. What should be the relationship between cloth and food so no one gets screwed? That is, the farmer doesn't get hurt. The farmer doesn't get hurt. And the manufacturer of cloth does not get hurt. That is, the workers here. What should be the exact relationship so there is no, so there is uh, no cheating? Yeah? Like there should be equal and use value. Yeah, what should be the relationship now? There should be equal and use value. Sorry, I need a quantitative relationship between the two. Yeah, man. Two costs or one food. One food. That's what the plaintiffs have to say. What the gentleman just did. Why is this the price? The price of food is two units of cloth. The price, right, the price of food, the price in the market is two units of cloth. Okay. If this were eight dollars, then each piece of cloth would sell for four dollars. Why is this fair? Because the farmer, the communist farmer, gives up a unit of food that's worth eight and gets back two units of cloth which are worth four times two eight. That's how he came up. Okay, I'll see you on Tuesday.